Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Sweetland Edwards. I'm an editor at Time. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, the goal of the session, as many of you know, is to discuss and really envision a new ocean economy that's both sustainable and just. And we'll talk about how multi stakeholder partnerships can and must be involved in helping transition and diversify small island developing states' economies. Two years ago, I was uh, on a panel similar to this. And um, of course, now the context is completely different um, with COVID that has um, you know, destroyed roughly a third of the tourism uh, economy and GDP for a lot of these states have dropped by roughly 7%. So we come at this session with a sense of timeliness and urgency. Um, thank you all very much for being here. A couple notes about the session. Um, it will unfold in two parts. The first part is uh, a roughly 30 minute session. It's a broad discussion of the issues. Um, it will be live streamed. The second is a more detailed discussion for invited forum members and partners. If you're staying on for that second part, please uh, just stay on the Zoom call and we'll, uh, we'll get you uh, over to your breakout groups. Um, the second note is uh, please reach out to each other using TopLink and Virtual Congress Center. This is uh, for networking and discussing and just following up on some interesting points. This is um, the World Economic Forum after all. It's the, the, uh, the best place to network in the world. So everyone, please take advantage of that. I uh, would like to, I guess, jumpstart this by introducing Ambassador um, Peter Thompson, who uh, is the United Nations Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Ocean. Um, and he will uh, give us a few minutes of, of opening remarks to, to set the stage here. Ambassador. Thank you very much. And uh, Prime Minister and uh, ladies and gentlemen, greetings one and all. Look, on behalf of all the speakers, I want to extend best wishes to you and your loved ones that you may enjoy a healthy and happy time in the year ahead. For so many, of course, these are not happy times. We are facing the deepest global recession since the Great Depression. And to quote the President of the United Nations General Assembly from his address to member states last week, the pandemic has created a socioeconomic crisis. It's hijacked our development trajectory and it's hit vulnerable countries especially hard. So when it comes to vulnerable countries, small island developing states, so-called SIDS, are in a class of their own. The majority of SIDS rely heavily on tourism for their foreign exchange earnings and employment and related local industries. And the COVID-19 pandemic has caught them in a cruel twist of circumstance. Many SIDS, thanks to their geographical isolation and strictly applied quarantine restrictions, have yet to be ravaged by the coronavirus. But the pandemic has put their all important tourism industries on hold. With the light of vaccinations now glimmering at the end of the pandemic's long tunnel, in this Davos session, we're asking ourselves what policies and practices and partnerships are needed to build back a more just and resilient ocean economy. There is just a, a, a growing acceptance, I have to say, that we must not return to old habits of waste, pollution, and over-exploitation of finite planetary resources. Well, what does the blue-green recovery road entail for SIDS? Given their natural beauty and their special qualities, SIDS will no doubt continue to have vibrant tourist industries. But the challenge will be how to make them less dependent on food and service imports, how to integrate them more productively into local industries, how to bring them into better harmony with the fragile island ecosystems. In short, how to truly develop sustainable tourism industry. The second response must surely be diversification of the economies of SIDS, with a view to making them less vulnerable to external shocks. Here is where the development of the sustainable blue economy holds so much pro promise for SIDS. And may I say the time is right for action, with capital increasingly moving in that direction. There's so much for us to discuss, so I look forward now to the ideas and solutions that will be forthcoming from this session. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I would like to now introduce our three panelists, um, beginning with Prime Minister Alan Chastanet, the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, of course. Prime Minister. Haley, great to be here, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. And I just want to latch on to one thing that you said 
um, from the onset, which is this sense of, of urgency. And so I, I'm really attending today's forum with that very, very much in mind. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to hearing from your unique perspective. Uh, also, everyone participating in this, please feel free to drop questions or um, into the chat box um, after each of the panelists introduces themselves. We will um, turn to those questions and, uh, and the audience, uh, the virtual audience. Um, our next panelist is um, Gloria Fuchsia Tineman, the Vice Chairman and Chief Sustainable Officer of Iberostar Group in Spain. Thank you for being here, Gloria. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, despite the extremely difficult circumstances, tourism is facing the most challenging times of its history. Um, with international arrivals dropping close to more than 70% last year, going back to levels of 30 years ago, a low morale of the workforce and a tremendous job description destruction. Due to this panorama, you can hear a lot of the argument from people saying, now is not the time to think about the oceans, or now is not the time to invest in circularity, or to reduce the carbon footprint of the hotels. But now more than ever, it's the time to discover, discover the potential of the tourism sector, to innovate, to reinvent itself for a resilient and responsible tourism model, making sure it will be able to overcome future adversities and crises like this one. Um, from Iberostar's side, we continue working with clear strategic objectives using science, the transversal implication of the organization, and we also want to be measured so we can align to the advances of the sector and serve as a reference and inspiration when possible. Our momentum hasn't stopped throughout the pandemic. Our science team has continued with the research in our core lab in the DR, for example, or they're helping us quantify how nature-based blue carbon offsets can be used to achieve carbon neutrality in our operations by 2030. I would just mention two brief examples of the work we've done in the recent months and throughout the pandemic as well. Um, we launched a paper with WEF two years ago on the business case for MPAs and their interaction with tourism, specifically on how the industry could play a role in its protection. Of all of our properties in the Caribbean, only two of our beach firms have active MPAs. So it was clear for us that we wanted to collaborate and support on establishing new sanctuaries or protected areas. The first case of our active involvement is in Jamaica. Our hotel is located proximate to a fishing community that has been there for decades and noted a decline in their catch. We're working with a local group called Dora Cabeza to see if we can co-establish vision sanctuary by learning lessons from a sanctuary that was just down the road of our hotel and that after being led by fishermen for 10 years, saw an increase of 200 fold in fish biomass on the exterior of the protected area. We want to see if we can recreate that model in Montego Bay while simultaneously kickstarting reef restoration in the protection area or sanctuary itself to speed up reef recovery and provide alternative opportunities for the fishermen in the interim. In Aruba, um, the focus is on education, and this is our second example. Uh, the island has a fantastic educational program, but you can't find only ocean-focused education or a saltwater aquarium with corals, and that's what we wanted to complement. You can't take care of marine ecosystems without the involvement and the pride of the local community. And many times the complexity lies in that there is little access of that community to life below water. Again, that's what we wanted to support. In order to do so, we're constructing the first ocean education center housed in our new hotel in Aruba. At the center, a new curriculum base on Aruba's marine ecosystems will be taught. The center is dedicated to 22,000 kids of elementary school so that we can enrich their marine curiosity until middle school. I could share many more examples from our advances in Spain, in the Dominican Republic or Mexico, but being conscious of time, um, I will conclude. We have seen how the industry has been capable to make sweeping changes in the face of the pandemic for health reasons and the well-being of the clients. The potential has been incredible, so let's just use that potential of the industry to make a profitable and responsible tourism model that is also an ally of the oceans and climate. And I think that the time really is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. Um, I'd now like to introduce Karen Fang, who's the Managing Director, Global Head of Sustainable Finance at Bank of America. Karen? 
Thank you, everybody. I'm very, very pleased to be here. And Prime Minister and Ambassador, thank you uh, for being uh, giving us your remarks and being a part of this great panel. And Haley, thank you for moderating. Uh, so as Haley said, I run Global Sustainable Finance at Bank America. And that really means that we're putting our A-lines of business and global balance sheet and resources and capabilities, capabilities together to amplify capital deployment for environmental transition and social inclusive development. What that means is that when we talk about SIDS, this really is for us to very much zoom in on the intersection between environmental preservation and decarbonization, as well as the social inclusive development part, whether it's education or healthcare or many other critical issues that have been really kind of brought to the forefront given the COVID crisis. So as Haley said at the beginning, the GDP of these nations fell by 7%. So at 70 million people total for these 58 islands and at just over 1.2% global GDP, you know, the potential for these economies to rebound fast if we do the right thing between the public and private sector constituents to actually help these economies not just rebound but potentially grow at a faster pace than before by really kind of bringing in the necessary capital deployment for the major industries, whether it's sustainable tourism, sustainable um, fishing, as well as blue carbon, which Gloria talked about. All of these different things can bring amplified revenues if it's done responsibly, if it's done su sustainably. And we have a role to play in private sector as a financial institution. We already started the, the journey in terms of how do we scale renewable generation in these islands? How do we work with the World Economic Forum? and the His Royal Highness Prince of Wales Sustainable Markets Initiative to really kind of bring additional capital and additional innovative tools, such as the blue carbon, which really is just starting to show its potential now uh, to really kind of bring necessary revenue stream to these, to these nations. So Haley, I don't know if you wanted to open up for Q&A, but I'll pause my comment for now. Uh, that would be a, sort of an opening uh, thought from me. Thank you so much, Karen. That's great. I would love to open up to Q&A. First, I'd just like to hear from um, Prime Minister Chastanet on his perspective and, and what he'd like to um, discuss today. Thank you very much, Haley. So um, the, the quantum that we find ourselves or the quandary that we find ourselves in right now is the desire to um, preserve our blue economy. And let's understand that in my neck of the woods, um, in the, what we call the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, that size of, of marine reserve that we have is the same size as Germany, um, but only with a population of 1.4 million people. So that's a, a huge undertaking, even under great circumstances. We've seen, and we had an earlier discussion with regards to the financial or the debt cycle that SIDS have found themselves in. And so the exhaustion shocks of the financial crisis of climate change itself and the cost of resilience. And now the impact of the pandemic is taking oxygen away from our ability to fund many of these programs ourselves. So we now find ourselves leaning on the idea of debt swaps um, for policy exchange, I call it, in terms of, of preservation of our blue ocean. And we're also now trying to really push far, hard on some of the economic returns um, from the blue economy because it's there and has certainly not been contributing based on its size and its potential to the GDPs of our country. So we're seeing things like CMOS, um, the conversion of Sagasm into uh, uh, fertilizer, um, as well as now trying to expand our fisheries opportunities. So uh, to do these things all in a conservative way in which we're following our SDG goals and doing this in a sustainable way. The fourth one really is the funding of maintaining water quality levels. So we have, we're combating global warming um, and the impact on our coral reefs, and then the continuing uh, growth of our land-based development and the, the fallout from that. So actually putting greater forms of resilience into our land development to protect our reefs and on the water quality we have. So these are very difficult things to, to juggle. And I'm certainly looking forward and my continue working with the World Economic Forum on this country uh, financing map, which would include the development of this incredible resource that we know that we have there. The last one I really wanna put on the table is what we call the, the, uh, the blue tourism economy. And so the idea of the cruise industry, 
and other opportunities of growing tourism using this incredible resource that we have. Um, we think that we have, again, still great potential and making sure that that potential is not only translating into returns for the businesses, but also in helping to fund the sustainability of this, of this resource. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Um, let's just jump right into discussion. We don't have that much time here. Um, one of the uh, people in the chat mentioned, uh, you know, basically echoing what a lot of you said, this is a time of extraordinary challenge, um, but uh, challenges can be times of great opportunity. So um, Karen, you talked about this a little bit in your comments, the, the, this moment is, is maybe a moment that we can seize upon this and amplify the, the capital that we see um, funneled to SIDS. Can you talk a little bit about particularly this economic moment and why it might be why it might be unexpectedly optimistic? I am very optimistic because I feel that um, ESG was popular and it was a good topic for people to talk about, um, oftentimes to feel good about themselves maybe a decade ago. And it became sort of important, especially in the corporate sector five years ago, but now it's a must and it's a way of the future today, because if you go to any Fortune 500 companies, earnings or investor call now, this is not a side topic, this is a main topic. How are you dealing with your stakeholders, not just your shareholders, which means your clients, your employees, your communities? What are the societal impact you're generating in addition to your bottom line profit? What are you doing in terms of advancing UN Sustainable Development Goals? All these things are now becoming much more part of the corporate culture, which I think is very important constituent in addition to the government, the multilateral um, MDBs and agencies, because you need the private sector that's hiring people and really kind of driving change from a organic or bottoms up perspective to come in play and the, the culture change and the COVID in terms of the awakening it has caused around the globe, um, really everywhere, right? Not just the private sector um, has really, I, I think set the world onto a different, into a different direction. Obviously the US is celebrating a new administration in terms of focus on climate. And I personally very much like this intersection that the Biden administration is focusing on, which is environmental justice. That's the intersection between the E and the S, and I think it's particularly applicable to the SIDS economy that we're talking about here. So I'm optimistic because I think the culture has changed. I think the narrative has changed. I think the focus has changed. And this is not a this is not a trend. This is this is really just the way of the future. It's not going to be popular for 2021 because people are awakening from 2020, but I think this is the way of the future. And how we think about our financing plan, our client advisory plan, even carbon, right? Which I think blue carbon is gotta be a big part of the revenue um, generation for these island nations to preserve their coastal lines, to preserve their ocean resources, to actually generate jobs and generate GDP rebound and recovery that we're talking about. Because conservatively, between removal credits and reduction credits, by protecting these coastal wetlands and generating blue carbon credits to sell to governments as well as corporations that have de declared carbon neutrality and net zero, which, which is a big, big push for the, for the web as well, um, I think that the demand on carbon offsets, conservatively speaking, is in the tens of gigatons of offsets. Right now, globally, we're offering at about 200 million uh, tons of offsets a year, voluntary carbon offsets. I think the blue carbon credits can add conservatively around 700 million metric tons a year. That brings an additional almost $15 billion revenue for these nations that have massive ocean resources. So I'm optimistic that the capital and the desire and the action steps are going to be here this year and, and beyond. Thank you, Karen. There's, there's, there's so much there to unpack. I think one of the one of the points that I've heard in, in a lot of the discussions around this outside of this panel is um, where the rubber meets the road. You know, we can talk a lot about, um, about you know, sort of broad um, goals and, uh, and broad, you know, funneling of SDG, S, uh, SDG capital and things like that. But when we talk about these island nations, we're often talking about extraction industry and tourism. So how do we move how do we return to tourism in a post-COVID world in a way that is more sustainable 
and, uh, and you know, more forward-looking and inclusive. Um, I want to actually direct that quote, that answer, um, or that, to, that to, um, uh, to Gloria, who spoke a little bit about some of the, some of the examples of where the rubber is meeting the road on that. Yes, certainly. Um, and despite the challenging times, it, it shouldn't be an exclusive vision. It, we always like to call it the quest towards a more responsible tourism model, and it shouldn't be exclusive. In, in, in many ways, it gives you also a lot of advantages. In our case right now, because we're working towards our strategic goals, uh, for 2030, like, for example, becoming waste-free, becoming more sustainable in an aspect that we want to be carbon neutral by 2030. We've also reordered internally a lot of our processes. We've known a lot more our organization, so we're able to be prepared to bounce back better and to offer better options to the destinations. And now talking about destinations, uh, we also like to take them into account. Anytime uh, we do any kind of project, we want to be inclusive as well. And I'll, I'll, I'll just give one last example. When we are doing our carbon offsetting programs, for example, we know there's a lot that will come from an operational system that we're reducing our emissions by 2030, at least by 35% by the way we consume energy and another high percentage by just purchasing renewable energy in all our hotels. But when we're offsetting, we're thinking about the destinations and the communities. So 75% uh, of the compensation we will practically have to do by 2030 will be done in the destinations where we operate. We will empower the communities to support us in doing that. We will protect the nature and we will use nature-based solutions to make them rise. And again, just to fight towards that more responsible tourism model. Prime Minister, you also mentioned the, um, the blue tourism economy. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, again, where the rubber meets the road there. What, is that, what does that actually look like in St. Lucia right now? Well, you have the situation, for instance, the, the carbon tax that's being proposed. And, and mm -hmm. the carbon tax comes out of the understanding now that emissions is no longer a free good. There actually is a cost to emissions. And I think that right now is the time where we have to now start understanding that the maintenance and the strengthening and the replenishing of our blue economy, there's a cost. And so therefore, included in the usage of it, whatever it's going to be, has to start contributing to that development. The countries by themselves, which are given this mammoth task of managing this huge area with extremely limited resources, and that those limits, the limited resources are now being undermined by um, uh, debt to GDP targets and per capita GDP levels in terms of access to funding. And certainly now these exogenous shocks of which are things are outside of our control, but we have to now um, apply resources to it. That is causing us a problem. So we're, we're not even able to fund properly basic SDG goals, far less the maintenance of, of our blue economy. So whoever is using the facilities and benefits from the facilities, whatever um, monetization efforts are being put in, a portion of that has to be included to figure out how we're going to uh, continue to pay for the maintenance of, of this incredible re natural resource that we have. Absolutely. In note of justice there. We only have um, a few more minutes. These things go so quickly. I want to go through each of you, uh, Karen, Gloria, Prime Minister, very quickly. Um, we have people on in this session who are not um, necessarily totally fluent in all the jargon um, of, of uh, you know, blue tourism and blue carbon and things like that. So each of you, if you had one, if you just can take one minute and say what you wish what you um, what you see as the as a very uh, as the most promising, perhaps, or something with an enormous amount of potential that you would like to that you wish the the general public knew more about. Um, let's start with uh, let's start with you, Karen. Um, I hope that a regional cooperation, because you look at SIDS are really largely divided into three different areas, right? The Caribbean and the, the Pacific area and the, isle, uh, and the Atlantic area. So when you think about regional cooperation, having the different island nations, you know, under the leadership of the prime minister, who is very vocal, and I think it's a great spokesman for Caribbean and, and kind of putting himself on the country road, uh, uh, financing roadmap with the WEF, we, we've been working on a bunch of projects. If the regional cooperation is there, we can have a more unified regulatory framework 
a, a, a very unified request for proposal for renewable generation or sustainable fisheries or sustainable tourism type of financing, all of a sudden we don't just need the St. Lucia government to put these debt, the, the prime minister articulated this point, right? It's not just sovereign debt that can finance these good causes and SDG goals anymore. I think the, the regional cooperation and the unified regulatory framework and a very simplified RFP process to invite more foreign direct investment and, and foreign capital to come into the nation to address the blue economy, which in my you know, very simple mind is the blue tourism, the fisheries, as well as the blue carbon. These are the three components that we can scale then we can potentially make it more bankable and make it more, you know, essentially a non-on-balance sheet debt for the government. And I think that will be a win-win-win for the world. And I'm just very much focused on that. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, Gloria, I'm sorry to rush you, but as quickly as possible, please. No, no worries. Um, I think one of the things that for us is most relevant when we're striving towards that responsible model and thinking about blue carbon solutions or any kind of solutions that have to do with sustainability is the collective action. So we're members, for example, of, uh, of the Sustainability Task Force of the World Travel and Tourism Council, but there's so much that we can do individually as a private company. So what we would make is a call for as much collective action as possible to achieve those results and, and that more responsible tourism model level. Time. Absolutely. Thank you. And let's end with you, Prime Minister. You, you thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thank you. So, you know, the, a big one really is debt swaps um, that we've been talking about. So the idea that um, governments would dedicate policy space, i.e. making sure that we maintain um, uh, a very strict preservation to marine sites, and in exchange, um, a third party um, who values justice, environmental justice, can buy that debt and repay it directly to who we have with. So it relieves the country of some of its debt obligations, but in exchange adopts the recurrent expenditure of maintaining a preservation area. Um, persons who are currently using it, so cruise ships, um, yachties, um, divers, that part of their package would include monies that would be allocated directly um, to the preservation of these areas and to the research. So for instance, um, with the cruise industry, $1.50 um, goes off towards helping maintain uh, sewage and landfill sites. So that's a, a direct thing that would um, reduce the amount of effluent that would be going into the ocean. Uh, and then the, the last one really is to be looking at it on a collective basis. So for St. Lucia to be looking at its um, marine space in isolation would be difficult. But all of a sudden, if we're doing it as the Caribbean, and if in fact the Asian and Indian Ocean um, SIDS are also working collaboratively together, then we can bring more, more to the table. And therefore we could monetize what we're offering um, to a greater account and become substantially easier. Thank you so much, Prime Minister, and, and a huge thanks to uh, the rest of our speakers, our panelists, uh, Ambassador Thompson. Um, as one of our commentators just said, um, Rupert Howes, our house is on fire, quoting Greta. These are, these are urgent issues, and um, we look forward to discussing them in the future.